You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art Ed? Who tried to spice it? Who art Ed? Mr. Wood art Ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's I ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to great start. Welcome to Who Arted Weekly Art History for All Ages. I'm your host, Kyle Wood. Now, as it's mid-October and the spooky season, I thought it would be the perfect time for a spooky fun fact mini-episode on the Ouija board and ghosts. For those thinking the Ouija board is just a silly game, I would largely agree, but simultaneously, I think seemingly trivial things can offer tremendous insights into culture. For example, as I looked into the rise of the Ouija board and different time periods where it spiked in popularity, it struck me that the popularity of the novelty seance kit seems to be strongly correlated with social upheaval. 1967 was known as the long hot summer because of the struggle for civil rights and unrest in many major cities in the U.S., Vietnam War protests were boiling over, and the Ouija board actually sold more copies than Monopoly. There were also spikes in popularity of the Ouija board during the World Wars. And it makes sense that we would see people turning to something like a talking board and similar practices when things seem bleak and uncertain. There's a comfort that comes from faith in some form of spirits and other forces beyond what we see in front of us. I would argue that's why we saw the Ouija board take off on the heels of the spiritualist movement in the 19th century. Now, in the middle of the 19th century, a spiritual awakening swept up millions of believers across America and Europe. Spiritualism offered solace, connection, and a glimpse into the unseen world. It's hard to pinpoint an exact moment for such a movement to begin, but many trace the origin to the Fox sisters in Hydesville, New York. In 1848, they caused quite a stir as they claimed mysterious tapping sounds were a ghost communicating with them from beyond the grave. These sounds were later revealed to be created by the sisters cracking their toe joints. Despite this, their story gained widespread attention and fueled the growing spiritualism movement in the United States. Although they later did confess to the hoax, the popularity of spiritualism persisted, and the Fox sisters remained influential figures in the movement. The allure was multifaceted, resonating with the deepest human desires and anxieties at the time. The Second Great Awakening had already paved the way for a more personal and emotional approach to religion, leaving a lot of people receptive to new spiritual experiences. The Victorian era, with high mortality rates and the devastating losses of the Civil War, created a profound longing for connection with departed loved ones. I have to imagine the families suffered even more during the Civil War because so many soldiers were listed as simply missing as their bodies could not be identified and word just traveled slowly. Uncertainty left the proverbial sword of Damocles hanging over so many for unbearably long. Spiritualism offered a bridge between the living and the dead, providing closure, comfort, and reassurance in the face of grief. Spiritualism provided a sense of community and belonging. It offered a space for people to explore their beliefs, share their experiences, and find solace in a rapidly changing world. The advent of new technologies like the telegraph, which seemed to defy the limitations of time and space, further fueled the belief that communication with the spirit world was possible. As I covered in a previous mini-episode, spirit photography provided all the proof needed for those who wanted to believe. And if you want to learn more about that, check the links in the show notes. Now, at the core of spiritualism were the beliefs in the continuous existence of the soul after death and the possibility of communication with spirits through mediums. Seances, often held in darkened rooms, became a popular way for people to connect with the departed and seek guidance from the spirit world. These gatherings were not only spiritual experiences, but also social events, fostering a sense of community and shared belief. As the movement gained momentum, 
so too did the market for tools and devices that could facilitate communication with the spirit world. It was in this fertile ground that the Ouija board emerged, a seemingly simple yet enigmatic tool that would capture the imagination of generations to come. You might say there are precursors to the Ouija board dating back thousands of years, as people from various cultures around the world have created numerous ways to allow the gods or spirits to communicate. A talking board is not such a novel concept. An earlier similar practice involved a planchette with a pencil attached, but the writing tended to be hard to decipher. The Ouija board as we know it, with the planchette simply moving over an arrangement of letters, numbers, and yes, no, and goodbye, that was the brainchild of Elijah Bond and Charles Kennard. They marketed the board as the ancient Egyptian good luck board, creating an alluring mystique as though it were based on some ancient magic. Early advertisements touted the board's ability to answer any question. In fact, one of the stories of the origin of the name Ouija is that they asked the board to name itself. According to those sources, when asked what Ouija meant, the board spelled out good luck. There are other theories suggesting it was based on a popular writer, Maria Louise Ramey, who used the pen name Ouida. But the theory I find most plausible is that Ouija was just a unique and vaguely exotic-sounding word that they thought would grab people's attention. The board was patented in 1891 by Elijah Bond, and that's an odd and interesting story in and of itself. Bond filed a patent for the Ouija or Egyptian luck board, but the patent office was initially hesitant to grant it. They considered the board's ability to answer questions to be unexplainable and potentially fraudulent. To convince the patent officer, Bond and Helen Peters, his sister-in-law, conducted a demonstration. They asked the board to spell out the patent officer's name, which it supposedly did correctly even though they claimed not to know it. The demonstration worked. The patent officer reportedly quite shaken by the experience, approved the patent. So, how does all this spooky magic happen? Spoiler alert, ghosts aren't bound to talk to us through novelty games. A Ouija board works through a combination of subconscious movements and just the power of suggestion. Participants lightly place their fingers on a planchette, a small movable pointer, and focus on questions. The idiomotor effect takes over. That's tiny, unintentional muscle movements influenced by thoughts and expectations that cause the planchette to move across the board, seemingly spelling out the answers. The power of suggestion and group dynamics can amplify this effect, leading participants to believe an external force is guiding the planchette. Because the idiomotor effect is happening unconsciously, the participants sincerely believe that they are not moving the planchette. As participants accuse each other of moving it, and they honestly deny responsibility, the group is left to wonder what force was acting through them. Interestingly, for those doubting the idiomotor effect at play with the Ouija board, tests have been conducted with blindfolded participants and boards turned sideways. When participants do not know the layout of the board, the answers spelled out are random nonsense. On the other hand, when participants can see the board, they tend to get the answers they can read and understand. While the spiritualist movement d eventually declined in popularity, its legacy lives on. The Ouija board, once a tool of spiritual exploration, has become a cultural icon, a reminder of a time when boundaries between the living and the dead seemed permeable. Its enduring appeal speaks to the enduring human need for connection and comfort in an ever-changing world. Now, after a short break, I want to share a quick fun fact about the classic ghost costume. Ugh. 
Looking into the Ouija board had me thinking about how odd our connection to ghosts is. I mean, we have ideas of invisible spirits moving a planchette to spell things out, but we also have urban legends of hitchhiking ghosts that look like regular people. And of course, we can't forget the classic lazy Halloween costume simply throwing a sheet over yourself and claiming to be a ghost. You ever wonder how a bed sheet became the costume for a ghost? It turns out that was actually how people expected ghosts to look for a while. Before the widespread use of coffins, the deceased were often wrapped in simple shrouds for burial. These were typically made of white linen or cotton, and they would be tied at the head and feet. This practice was especially common among the poor who could not afford elaborate coffins. Now, over time, the image of the shrouded corpse became associated with the idea of a ghost. As early as the 16th century, there were accounts of criminals using white sheets to disguise themselves as ghosts. This allowed them to scare people into handing over money or to commit other crimes under the cover of darkness. Even after several of these ghost impersonators were caught, the association between white sheets and ghosts persisted. There's evidence of theatrical productions using the sheet as a ghost costume in the 16th and 17th centuries, and it continues in popular culture even today in cartoons like Scooby-Doo. In the Victorian era, spirit photography became a popular trend. Photographers used double exposures and other tricks to create images of people with ghostly figures behind them. But often, these, quote, spirits were simply assistants draped in sheets, creating eerie and convincing photos. There's a brilliance in the simplicity. It's not only an easy and economical costume, it continues to have psychological resonance. The vague, amorphous form conceals the identity tapping into primal fears of the unknown. Or maybe it's just some campy, silly fun. I guess like so much of art, the impact and the meaning is largely in the eye of the beholder. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.